Thank you. You may be seated. Let's, let's pray together. God, I thank you that those words are true. That for those of us who are feeling lost and confused and disoriented, you are way maker. You make paths clear to us. You show us the next step that we're supposed to take in whatever, whatever crisis or chaos we're in. You are way maker. God, I thank you that you are, you are a miracle worker. I thank you that you can soften hard hearts. You can, you can liberate us from the grips of habits that keep pulling us down. You, you can heal deep rifts between husbands and wives and parents and children, brothers and sisters. You are a promise keeper. You are faithful. Ever and always, you're faithful. And even if we haven't seen the fulfillment of your promises, God, I thank you that we can, we can rest in the hope that fulfillment is coming in your way and in your time in accordance with your will. And you are light in dark places. Many of us, we need to hear that more than any. That you're light in the darkness in the midst of our own personal despair, in our own grief and loss. And as we as a nation sift through the ashes of yet, of yet another violent tragedy, even one in a house of worship, God, there's so many people who are saying, I don't understand. And we need you to show up anew. God, be light in, in the midst of very real darkness in our homes, in our neighborhoods, and our cities, and our nation at large. And lead us, God, so that we can bear that light in our homes, on our streets, in our schools, in our places of work. Let, a, let us be light with you that shine like stars, declaring the compassion of God in an often cruel world. Thank you for these opportunities, God, just for us to sing together and be reminded of who you say you are. Give us grace to walk in the light of that reality. We pray these things in the perfect name of a victorious Jesus. Amen and amen. Thank you so much. Today we're starting a new series called God at Work. It's a four-part series asking, thank you, questions about how we view our work through the lens of who God is and what God cares about. And some of you, you're already like, wait, time out. Like, I have my church life and I have my work life. I try to keep those separate. This morning I was driving into this place with my daughter and I was telling her about a resource that we're thinking about designing to help Parents who have children in youth sports find the intersection between that crazy world and what we believe. And she goes, Dad, you can't mix Jesus and sports. Like, those are, those, those are different things. And I was like, I, we need to have a longer conversation about this after church. But a lot of us, we, we have the same mentality of work. We go, we have, I've got work here, and I've got faith here. And those, just, those are different realities. Those are different buckets. Those are different spaces. Last Sunday, I was in our kitchen, and I was having a conversation with my 14-year-old. She seemed a little glum, and I go, honey, what's going on? And she goes, I don't want to go to school tomorrow. I go, is something happening at school, or is it just the fact that it's a Monday? And she's like, it's a Monday. <laughs> Has anybody ever had that feeling? Like, if your boss is here, don't raise your hand. But you ever had that feeling where it's a Monday at 7, like the alarm goes off, and you're like, I'm not, I'm not feeling it today. I, I think I, I would, if I, given the option, I'd prefer to call in because it's just, it's the, it's the drudgery, it's the monotony, it's the doing the same thing, it's the repetitive nature of it over and over and over again. You know, like there's a reason why they have a phrase that says, thank God it's Friday and not thank God it's Monday. Why? Because many of us, we, we feel like work is something that we have to endure as a means to some other end. We work so that we can support our family. We work so that we can advance our career aspirations. We work so that we can pay for our lifestyle choices. 
One, one definition of, of work is this, to fulfill duties regularly for wages or salary. To fulfill duties regularly for wages or salary. All of us have tasks that we have to do on a regular basis. Some of us are paid for those tasks, and some of us are not. If you're a student, you have work. Like, your job is to show up for class, and to pay attention, and to do homework, and to graduate, hopefully on time. That's your job. That, that, that's, you have tasks, you have a supervisor, you have deadlines, and you have a, re, you have a reward. If you're a manager of your household and you are tasked with meal planning and laundry services and you're the full-time, on-call family Uber driver, you have tasks. Remember one time, my wife Kelly was at work where she's a nurse and I was, it was, I was at home watching over our children and I had a conversation with my older sister and she goes, what are you doing today? And I go, oh, I'm babysitting. And she goes, they're your children, right? I said, yes. She goes, that's called parenting. So I said, that's not her job, that's your job. You do that, to, you, you guys do that together. I was like, oh, I, this, like, I'm not taking a day off and watching somebody else's children. I'm actively engaging in work, the work of developing young lives that have been entrusted to our care. If you're retired and you choose to assist adult children with grandchildren or you volunteer, you, you have tasks, you have a job. And the question is, what does God say about how we go about the tasks that have been entrusted to us? whether we're employed or whether we're looking for work or whether we're retired or whether we're students. What does God say about the, the daily Monday through Friday tasks that are in our life rhythm? How is God inviting us to view the nature of our work? And what would it take for us to get to a place where we could say, in all honesty, thank God, it's Monday. I think there are three myths that undercut our ability to appreciate work well. The first myth is this. Many of us have been taught that work is inherently, inherently unspiritual. Work is unspiritual. That's a myth that we buy into. But the truth is, work is a part of God's design. Work is part of God's design. Listen to what we read in Genesis chapter 1. God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness. So that they may rule over the fish of the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful, increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it, they will be yours for food. And to all the beasts of the earth and all the birds in the sky and all the creatures that move along the ground, everything that has the breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw all that he had made and it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. Genesis 2 says, Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. And by the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because he rested from all the work he had done creating the world. God invented work. God wires us for work. God redeems work for his purposes. God created the very concept of creation. In his fascinating book on work and vocation, Timothy Keller, the book is called Every Good Endeavor, says this. He goes, there's a rhythm to God's creation. God creates the sky, and then he fills the sky. And God creates the sea, and then he fills the sea. God creates the earth, and then he fills the earth. He creates spaces, these canvases, and then he fills them with beauty and artistry and life. And when God completes an act of work, what does God say? God says, it's good. It is good. And when he gets to the end, he goes, it's very good. Have you ever had a moment in your work, school, or home life when you completed a task that was entrusted to your care with a high degree of excellence and you look back and you go, oh yeah, that's good. I did that. That was pretty epic. Did you, did you have a moment where you finished an exam or completed a report or you closed a deal and navigated a merger or at a hospital, you responded successfully to a code. You, you maybe put in a tricky IV. You discharged a patient who is well again. 
You secured funding for your startup. You thought of an innovative way to teach math to third graders. You got all the kids to school, to soccer, to dinner, to the homework table, and into bed alive again. And on your best days, you said, that was good. That felt right. I was made for this. I think we can only view work through a right lens when we know work is part of God's design. God does work. And God delights in the work that he does. And God has created work for our delight, for our pleasure as well. So the first myth is that work is inherently unspiritual. It's not true. Work is a part of God's design. The second myth is that work is less important than worship. Work is less important than worship. When in fact, work is an expression of worship. Our work is a means by which we declare the glory, the goodness, and the wonder of God. Genesis 2, 8 and 9 says, Now the Lord had planted a garden in the east in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed. The Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. And in the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The Lord took the man and put him in the garden to work it. And take care of it. God took the man, put him in the garden to work it and take care of it. So God plants the garden. That shows intention and design. But then God opts not to run the garden. God is the founder who then hires a CEO to take over Garden of Eden operations. Master gardeners know about plants, soil, irrigation, food, and weed control. So God initiates an industry and then he places a person inside of that system to run it. Have you ever stopped to think that God, either by his active or permissive will, has designed every industry that exists today? At least the ones that are not immoral, illegal, unethical, or unbiblical. And God has placed people in those fields And God is inviting every single one of us to join him in the act of co-creation in the space in which we have been placed. When we work and when we care for our work environment or our school environment or our home environment, we are participating in worship. Timothy Keller says that God gives humans a command that he does not give the animals. He gives the animals a command that is mindless, that doesn't require any thought or intentionality, which is to multiply. But he asks humans to fill. He goes, fill the earth. Create systems and products and technology and facilities and uh, ways to honor customers. That's a way that you fill the corporate space or the workspace that you have been placed in. The Hebrew word for work, avad, is also translated into the word worshiper. Work and worshiper have the same root in Genesis. Now, when I was in elementary school, I was taught that when we die, we go to heaven. And we go to heaven, we're there for eternity. And I go, that sounds like a long time. I go, what do we do for eternity? And they go, oh, we worship. And the only model that I had for worship was singing songs. Now, don't get me wrong. I love to sing as much as the next guy. But like after about an hour and a half, two hours, like the standard length of a good concert, I tap out. And so the, the, the idea that we would have like a 1,000 song playlist that we run on repeat for a million years, that sounds a little overwhelming to me. And sometimes I forget that what do we read? We read in the book of Revelation that in the new heaven and the new earth, there's going to be a, a city. See, if there was work before the world fell apart, then we have every reason to believe that there will be work after God restores all things. And if there is a heavenly city, in that city there will be people who are engaged in meaningful work that is honoring to God and honoring to one another. It doesn't say that when we get to heaven, the only structure will be a worship arena. It says that there will be a city. What I love when I read John chapter 21 and Acts chapter 1 is that when Jesus is resurrected, one of the things that Jesus does in his resurrection body is he meets his friends at their office. They're fishermen, so Jesus shows up on the beach, and when they're done with their all-night shift, what is Jesus doing for them? He's cooking them breakfast, which is a service industry task that is required for their survival. Jesus is doing work. Jesus, even in his resurrected body, isn't floating six inches off the ground playing a harp, singing songs about himself. 
Jesus is engaged in tasks that bring God glory and show honor and respect to his friends. Work is worship. And if we worship in eternity, may I propose that it's possible that God is going to give us meaningful tasks on the other side of this one that allow us to experience joy and allow us to honor God well. Some of you say, that's all fine and good. You have not been to my workplace. It is repetitive. It is monotonous. It is dysfunctional. Every day I show up, it feels like drudgery. How, what do I do? Like, how do I rise above that? And if you are overwhelmed where you feel trapped or confined, and it's hard for you to get energized on any given day, there's an exercise that we're going to try together as a church between now and Thanksgiving. We're going on what we're calling a gratitude journey. And for those of you who want to, you can go online and print out a form that has a bunch of different slips of paper. All you do is just cut up those slips of paper, and the task goes like this. Everybody in your family, or maybe if you're single and you're living with roommates, everybody in your house, or maybe if you want to bring this to your place of work, anybody who's a follower of Christ, or actually they don't even have to be, anybody who wants you in your department can write down one thing that you are thankful for every day. One person one moment, one experience, one gift, one resource, one item that you're thankful for every day. And at the end of the day, you collect those slips of paper and you put them, some of you have joy jars that we talked about last year, you can put that in your joy jar, or you just put it in a cardboard box. Just have, have a place where you put those slips of paper. And then, when we all come back here for our Thanksgiving service on Thanksgiving Day, we're gonna invite you to bring your slips of paper. And we're gonna put all of our slips of paper together in a pile. And we're going to be, have a visual reminder of all the ways that God is faithful to all of us. And sometimes I, I think that in, if there's one area that's difficult for us to be grateful for, we're grateful for what's happening in our home lives. And a lot of times we're grateful for what we see God doing outside of our nine to five. But what would happen if we said, what's, what is one moment that I could thank God for at work every day? Is there one moment where I could say, oh, God broke th through here, or God gave me an opportunity to use my gifts, or God gave me an opportunity to give another person a smile, or somebody took advantage of an opportunity to, to brighten my day, or to lighten my load, or help me out with the, my project. What's, what's something that God is doing every single day that I can be grateful for? Because gratitude is always the antidote to complaint. And so one practice that we can do to remind ourselves that work is worship is to, is to worship with my mind while I'm at work. Some of you are grateful for new life in Christ. You, in the past couple of weeks or months, you've made a decision to become a follower of Jesus Christ for the very first time. But maybe you've never been publicly baptized to let other people know your story, to declare to others, whether it's your family or your neighborhood or your work friends, that Jesus had done, has done something transformational in you. So on Thanksgiving Day, we're going to we're going to celebrate what we're grateful for. And on the Sunday following, we're going to celebrate baptism together. So if you've never been publicly baptized as a declaration of your faith, would invite you to go online and get more information. You can talk to me personally. We'll get you signed up to do baptism on the Sunday after Thanksgiving. What I love about the visual imagery of baptism is that when you go under the waters of baptism, you are completely drenched. Like the water covers every part of you. And it's our way of saying, God, I want you to have reign and rule over my body, my mind, my spirit, and all of the places I go and all of the things I touch. So we get baptized. We're saying, God, I want you to baptize not just my private life and desires. I want you to baptize my public life and my desires. I want you to baptize the me that participates in work or school or home and relationships. Every arena of my life, I want to be drenched in your wisdom and your spirit. So if you've never been baptized before, I want, to, I, want you to strong, I want to strongly encourage you to consider getting baptized here on this stage on Thanksgiving weekend. Uh, for those of you, you're like, well, I've got friends and family in town. Uh, great. Friends and family need to know <laughs> that what God has done in your life is worth celebrating. So one myth that we buy about work is that it's inherently unspiritual. But the truth is work is God's design. Sometimes we get tempted into thinking that work is less than worship when, in fact, work is a means by which we worship. And then finally, some of us believe that work is a curse. And some of you are like muttering under your breath, amen to that. Some of us think that work is a curse, that it's a result of the fall. 
And the truth is this, work is complicated by the fall, but God redeems our work for his purposes. How many of you like ever grew up in a church environment where you said like before, before Adam and Eve screwed up, everybody was just fine. Like God had them in the garden and they were on like lawn chairs sipping mimosas. Like everything was fine and dandy. Well, when we read the passage, actually we know that that's not true. Before sin entered the world, Adam and Eve were already working. But after sin entered the world, the environment in which they did their work changed dramatically. We read this in Genesis 3, after Adam and Eve had consciously made a decision to push against God. To Adam, God said, because you listened to your wife and ate fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you. And you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground. Since from it you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust you will return. If Genesis 3 is correct, then here's what we know. Work is not cursed. But the ground is cursed. Some of the challenges that we face at work reflect the spiritual dysfunction that come when people reject God and his design for our lives. Adam's decision to reject God has immediate and toxic consequences for his place of work. Now some of you say, like, Adam didn't have an office to go to. I, I disagree. Adam has to fight for his survival now, and his work includes a family farm. And on this family farm, he has a co-owner, which is Eve, and he has employees, which are his sons. His sons' names are Cain and Abel. This is what we read about workplace dysfunction in Genesis chapter 4. Abel kept flocks. He works. Cain worked the soil. That's his job. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. And Abel also brought an offering, fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry and his face was downcast. What is the first symptom of broken relationships at work? Envy, jealousy, desire for status, competition, comparison, and shame. Has anybody ever viewed these in full effect in your place of employment? An unhealthy view of work transforms our workplace into a battleground for personal worth. An unhealthy view of work transforms our workplace into a battleground for personal worth. And if you're in a season of life where you don't yet know how much God loves you, and you don't know that your identity is supposed to be born out of your relationship with God, and not out of whatever status you can achieve outside of God, you don't understand this. And as a result, if my identity is not anchored in who Jesus is, then I'm looking for my worth at work. And I need promotions. I need compensation. I need awards. I need the right office. I need the right influence. I need the right power dynamics to be in play for me to feel good about myself. How many of you know that that is a losing battle? You can be in the same industry for 40 years and you can climb up and up and up and up the chain and look back and say... I don't know that this was worth it. And there are so many of us who bring our insecurities to bear at the work saying like, maybe this quarter I'll hit numbers. Maybe this quarter I'll be at the top of the pile. Maybe this quarter I'll close on this deal and then I'll matter and then I'll have worth and then I'll be significant and then my spouse will respect me and then I'll, then I'll have people who like and trust and believe in me. Rather than saying, oh, I know who I am in Jesus this work gives me an opportunity to thrive in the things that I'm created to do. Whether it succeeds or fails, it does not have any direct bearing on who I am. When we have an unhealthy view of who God is and who we are, we bring that into our places of work. And we get tempted quickly to step on other people to get what we want or to cut corners in order to self-promote. And this doesn't just happen at work. It happens at home. It happens at school. It happens in the academy. It happens in nonprofits as well. 
And God is inviting us to reclaim our skills for his glory and the well-being of others. Ephesians chapter 4 says, Anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with their own hands that they may have something to share with those in need. Two thoughts. One, I've had an opportunity to do some ministry in facilities where people were incarcerated when I was in college. And then I had the opportunity to volunteer as a police chaplain for about 13 years in suburban Detroit. Here's what I learned. People who break the law on a regular basis are some, oftentimes some very intelligent and creative people. Like there, there, there are some people, they've, they've got leadership skills, but they're leading the wrong people towards the wrong, they're leading people who have been created in God's image towards the wrong ends. And there are people who, they come up with really, really intriguing ways to do some really twisted things. And what is Paul saying? He's saying, God has given you abilities that you have been using in warped ways for your own self agenda. And God wants you to take those same abilities, that same mind, that same creativity, and redirect it into something that is a service to others. In the book Every Good Endeavor, Tim Timothy Keller says that in the Greek model, the Greek philosophers thought that if you did something with your hands, it meant that you didn't have great value to the development of society because the best jobs were people who could sit around and be philosophers all day. That the only people of, of worth were the people who didn't do manual tasks, but who did thinking tasks. But the Apostle Paul says, I want you to work with your hands so that you'll have something of value to offer her. One thinker says, isn't it fascinating that out of all of the careers that God could have chosen in the form of Messiah, Jesus comes as builder. Jesus comes as carpenter. Somebody who affirms the dignity of manual labor. People who work with their hands. Why? So that they could be of service to others. That we can give to those who are in need. God wants to redeem all of the effects of the fall in our places of work. God wants to allow us to surpass and bypass and transcend temptations to manipulate work environments just for my agenda and my own twisted pride and say, God, how can I use this opportunity to be of service to your kingdom and to others, to clients, to employees, to supervisors, to colleagues? There's one more passage that I think is fascinating about work. We read it here in Romans chapter 16. Paul is just giving greetings to specific individuals in the church in Rome. And he says, greet Mary who worked very hard for us. Greet Tryphena and Tryphosa, those women who work hard in the Lord. Work hard in the Lord. He's saying that the way that they viewed their work was not, I'm going to advance myself or advance my industry. I'm going to advance the kingdom. Work is the environment in which I get to do that. And then he says, Gaius, whose hospitality I and the whole church here enjoy. So Gaius probably had a job that allowed him to have a home that was big enough for him to host the church that was meeting there. Sends you his greetings. Erastus, who is the city's director of public works, and our brother Quartus send you their greetings. It's fascinating that the people who comprised the, the church in Rome were both men and women, people who were doing ministry jobs and people who were doing corporate jobs and people who were doing civic jobs. The director of public works was somebody who was making sure that this fledgling church in the shadow of the emperor got off the ground. What do Mary, Tryphena, and Tryphosa have in common? What can Gaius, Erastus, and Cordus agree on? They believe that work is inherently spiritual. They believe that work is a means to worship. They believe that work is complicated by the fall, but is being redeemed for the kingdom. So I want to throw out three very specific challenges, three kind of practical application points for you as you head into work this week. The first one is this. God, what do you want me to know about my work? What do you want me to know about my work? What can you see about me in my place of work that I can't see, that I don't know? God, if there, if there are opportunities to serve others better in my place of work, will you, will you show me that? If there's something that you're trying to teach me about my character, will you show me that? 
God, what is it that you want me to know about my work? Second question. God, where do you want me to co-create with you this week? Where can I co-create with you this week? Is there a way that I can innovate at my place of work to make systems better? Or maybe I, maybe I don't have the resources or the leverage or the bandwidth or the title to affect broad change in my hospital or my school or my factory. But maybe... Maybe I can co-create by creating the kind of environment either on the factory floor or in the teacher's lounge or in the break room where people are honored and respected. That maybe I can be the voice that tempers conversations that might steer towards complaint or gossip or slander. Maybe my sheer presence and my desire to be committed to joy and dignity and honor and respect, God, maybe I can create an environment where people feel noticed and valued and appreciated. Maybe I'm not creating products, but maybe I'm creating an environment where people can be reminded that they matter to you. So ask yourself, God, what do you want me to know about my work this week? Ask yourself, how can I co-create with God? And then the last question is just for me. Ask yourself, would it ever be appropriate for me to invite my pastor to my job? So last service, I threw out this thing. I said, many of you go, Steve is all fine and good for you and your like fun little ministry job to pontificate about work. You have no idea where I live or what I do. So last service, I said, I would love to visit you at your place of work. And if it's, if it's appropriate, um, let me know and I'd love to join you. I've had, conver I've had invitations already to come to a camp and clean toilets, which I accepted. I had an invitation to come ride on a combine at a farm, which I can't, like, I can't wait to do. And I've had somebody invite me to go to a, des a, to a design firm and see how people design. I, I really do want to know where you are living your life and how your life works. And if you work a third shift, like my wife, and it's appropriate for me to come visit you at like 2 in the morning, I'm not doing anything else. I have no commitments. Uh, would love to come and see what your work is and how it functions. And if you're saying, hey, Steve, you don't understand, but in, if, if this series is going to go on for another three weeks, here's something I need for you to figure out immediately so that you can speak into this well. Because I am f always intrigued when I learn about how people are using their uniquely inspired kingdom gifts to live well. And some of you say, I, I don't know about you, but sometimes I've got the best intentions. Like I'll roll into the office and on my way in, I'm praying like, God, go before me. Allow this to be a day that's filled with your presence and help me to be aware of you and understand how you're moving. And um, anybody ever pray that they have a good day at work at, and like at 8.30, you're feeling great. And by the time you get to two o'clock, you're not even sure you're a Christian anymore. Like just, like it just completely jumped the rails. You go, I don't know what happened, but I, I feel like I lost my bearings. I had a friend once who said, um, he heard of a female executive and she just said she'd kind of hardwired into her planner. She set up a system where she would get like a little ping, a, a, an alert that would remind her on the hour, every hour to say a brief prayer. So maybe she could have been, she could have been in a sales meeting, uh, could have been right before she goes up to present, but she just had it, she had it time, so she just get this little alert that says like, I'm not going to excuse myself and kind of get down on my knees in the hallway and have a very public prayer moment, but just under my breath, I'm going to say, God, will you remind me that you're here with me today? Will you remind me that you are sovereign over all things in my workplace? Will you remind me that you care about the sale? Will you remind me that you care about this piece of gear? Will you remind me that you care about the food that we're going to produce and ship this week? Will you remind me of that? It remind me that my IT work gives you glory and honor and is deserving of my best effort? Will you remind me that all of our clients, even the ones that are, that are frustrating and demanding, they're created in their image and they deserve to be treated with honor and respect? Will you remind me of that? And sometimes it's just a very, it's, it's as simple as putting in a reminder that says, God is here with me at my work. God is working at my work. Lord, will you give me eyes to see it? So we're going to close doing something that's the same, but a little bit different. The team is going to lead us in um, some response songs where we say, God, will you remind me that you are, you are actively participating in my life and that you don't see my faith bucket and my work bucket as separate. You see those as, you desire those to be fully integrated. God, will you remind me that you are faithful to me, not just in these environments, but that you're faithful to me in my environment where I'm spending 
the majority of my time. That wherever it is that I'm standing at 1137 on a Tuesday morning, you're there. So as you sing, you're going to see images of different places of work. You see clinics and hospitals and schools and construction sites. Offices. You're going to see these different images as you sing. Just as a reminder to us that God wants us to be as aware of his presence and his goodness when we're in those places as we are we're in this place. Let me pray for us. God, you are always at work. In fact, your, work sa- your word says that you have started a work in us. And I believe the work that you have started in Central Wesleyan Church is not just for us to be people who look like you when we're here, but people who are being conformed to your likeness, people who are growing and stretching and expanding in the mind of Christ. When we're in our work environments, we're our home environments, and we're in our school environments. And God, I pray that you would open uh, the eyes of our mind and our spirit and our heart to see who you are, how you're at work, and how you're inviting us to join you. Even this week, lead us as we sing. In your name we pray. Amen.